Let me, let me start by saying this is the 21st century property direct definition of wealth. Doing what you want, when you want, with whom you want, unless you're married of course, uh, wherever you want, as much as you want, as soon as possible. You know, that's really what wealth is. It's having security for yourself and your family and then having the opportunity to be able to dream bigger, right? Because when money is absolutely scarce, you're kind of insular. You're not thinking big. You're not thinking outside the square. You don't have time and a chance to really shine. The people around you don't have that chance either. Okay, so in terms of getting to the outcome of well, what's the sort of number that we need? Because would you agree that you need some tangible, some numbers around your goal? Otherwise, the goal is just airy fairy. The more specific it is, the more likely it is you can implement it and have the right people on your team helping you achieve it. So, I want you to answer some of these questions for yourself. How old are you now? What age do you expect to retire and stop working? Um, and by the way, has the Australian government kept extending how long you work for? Why? Can't they can't afford the pensions, which is the correct answer. It's not just because our health is getting better and we want to not lose the experience of, of elderly Australians in the workforce. That's all nice, but it's not the truth. And the truth is that the number of people earning money to pay for the pension has reduced dramatically. And they can't afford for people living longer to be taking the pension for a lot longer. And that's one of the reasons. And do you actually know why they introduced superannuation? Who knows the actual reason? Well, the way it was sold to us, if you recall, was, oh, you'll have this choice, you put your money where you want, and you know, um, you can pick the different types of fund managers, you get internal choice, and blah, 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 blah. The rea reality was government um, employees had all these defined benefits, and all the big companies had, had um, employees on defined benefits, and all of this was unfunded. They couldn't work out how are we going to fund all these defined benefit schemes where people get paid for the rest of their lives a fixed amount of income. We can't afford it. Hey, how about we let people take control over it themselves and we give it to fund managers, therefore it floats. And whatever the fund manager gets is what they get and we're off the hook. That's actually the reason. I don't know if you know that, but that's the reason. Right? It was just, it took away a lot of their risk and took away a lot of their, their future obligation which was unfunded. Okay, and then eventually people said, well, I don't like the fact that someone is losing me money and I have to pay for the privilege. I could lose it myself and not have to pay for it. <laughs> Fair enough. So that's why self-managed super funds are actually one of the fastest growing asset categories in Australia. All right, back to the survey. What assets other than your own home do you hope to acquire by the age of retirement? What income do you want to live on? Do you understand these are really important questions to quantify what your goals are? Otherwise your goals are just too fuzzy. You can't get to them. So what are your goals? How would you design extraordinary um, lifestyle that you would choose? Chance to dream big. What would you love to do if money was no problem? Would you travel more? Would you buy more toys like jet skis or cars? Would you work less? Instead of five days a week, would you work maybe four days a week? Would you change careers? Would you give up your part-time job? Would you spend time homeschooling your children? What would be... <laughs> now, some people want to spend more time with their kids. <laughs> Janine, you're not one of them? <laughs> Not homeschooling them. Okay, all right, well, that's fine. All right. I know some people, that's what they choose to do. I, I actually watched this video once where um, the father was a pro surfer and, um, you know, he was divorced. Um, so he was the, the primary caregiver and he had four kids and they had a bus that toured up and down the, the coast of New South Wales and Queensland. So they were more up Queensland way in winter and they came further south in, in, in summer. And you know, they go surfing and he homeschools them and they have an incredible bond and an incredible education. Some people just wanna have that choice. I know some people, um, and I've, I've had friends that have actually done this, they've picked up their family and moved to, the, to um, like parts of um, the Amalfi Coast in Italy because they wanted their children to learn Italian in situ. And they have a fantastic time because, you know, unlike Australia where you drive home, park your car in the garage and you close the garage and the door and you don't interact with your neighbours and you could be on another planet as far as you're concerned, um, you know, they have dinner and then they go to the piazza in the middle of town and they all interact, all generations, all night. Kids are out till 11 o'clock with their parents, but everybody knows each other's business. They have this great social capital they build up. You know, I've seen that in Asia as well, in HDB apartments, that everyone in the void area just gets together all the time, you know? 
it's, it's a different way of life, but some people may choose to do something like that. You need money to do that. What work have you always wanted to do? Who here volunteers? Like I do a lot of volunteer work and my mum, when she was alive, she received from the YWCA an award because she had done it for some incredible long period of time. And what she did, she used to go into hospice, hospices and high care um, you know, retirement villages before she got really sick and needed the same thing. Um, and she used to sit there and sit and talk with them when no one else would visit them. And you know, I would find that really hard to do. I've done other things such as, who's heard of Basket Brigade? You know, things like that. And, and I, I used to sell peanut brittle as a kid and um, peanut bars for the paraplegic quadriplegic sports association. I was the number one seller of peanut brittle because <laughs> <laughs> I made everyone buy because it was for the paraplegic sports, sports people, right? Um, and then they came to our school. But, you know, if you have a goal that's bigger than you, you may want to do that, but you can't afford to fund it right now. I've got friends that do animal rescue and they want to do more of that, but they need money to do that. So think about a bigger goal, something that you yearn to do that causes you to feel really, really fulfilled. What would that be then? One of the things I did in Melbourne a few years ago was I actually ran one of the, the, um, the best escape days according to um, the Starlight Foundation for terminally ill and disabled children and their siblings and their parents. We took them to the circus, booked out the circus, we got face painting clowns there, we had photographers, we had all the um, circus performers teach them a lot of the tricks they're doing and you know these kids ate so much candy and lollies and they would have been on a sugar high for a week I reckon but um, you know they had a brilliant time and we, we sent them all the photos in high-res format of just candid photos of them having a great time and that's something that the families will keep forever and I actually felt really good about that because it wasn't hard work in fact it was really enjoyable doing so again if money wasn't an object how would your life be different how would you redesign it what other sort of contribution would you do and maybe that's you know helping other parts of your family that just need a bit of a help okay um, what would your wealth look, lifestyle look like? The cars, the houses, the travel, the family, the sports. One of the things as I've gotten older is I've realized I don't need things as much. It's more about the experiences. Wherever you're at is fine. There's no judgment. It's just got to find what's important to you and what you find fulfilling. Um, now, I tell you, I'll, I had an interesting scenario once. I had a gentleman come up to me and berated me. He said, this is rubbish. I don't care about any of this gold crap and things like that. My wife's got goals. I don't need any goals. It's fine. Get on with the content. And he yelled at me. <laughs> he, like, he fought on all these people around me. He was just yelling, get on with it. This is crap. I don't need any goals. My wife, she takes care of all of that. <laughs> and I went, well, sir, what do you really want out of life? And he goes, that doesn't matter. I just want to learn more stuff so I can do more things. He goes, this is useless. And he left. And everyone was just, they were stunned. Because I think deep down, well, you can tell me what you think deep down was going on with him. He was completely scared. I won't say the word, but the level of scaredness because he didn't have any goals. He didn't know, right? And thank God his wife could actually direct him because he wouldn't know what he wanted out of life, right? So anyway, I just want you to be clear because when you get clear, you show up as a completely different person. And, and in fact, I love doing this query, and I'll see if it works. Put your hand up um, if you do volunteer work again, right? And it's, it's funny, often the people who do volunteer work just have this, this smile and this glow about them because they just feel good and happy about it, right? How would that be? Thank you. How would that be going through life, feeling like that, right? But the reality is we need money in this world, and you need money to actually allow you to be able to do more of that. So I believe we're all, as I said, here on a journey, we want to get from A to B. You're going to need knowledge, the knowledge of others around you to help you get there the fastest, safest, easiest, um, cheapest way. Um, let me tell you about life. Um, now, yes, the, the ABS stats came out. I was so excited. They came out last week. They just got all republished from the latest census. I'm just working my way through those because it's so much fun. But I haven't worked out all the current tables, so it's based on the last census. But if you look up your age, um, whether you're male or female, this will tell you approximately how long they expect you to live for. Right? Approximately. Okay, so if you're a, a male aged 33, you've got another 47 years left in the tank, and that's it, roughly. Okay, if you're a female, you've got 51 years. Okay, so it gives you some sort of time frame as to you know, base some decisions on. If you're a bit older, well, obviously you have less. Oh, I was getting scared. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's getting scarier, isn't it? All right? But, but you know what? I don't do this to scare you. I do some of this to help motivate you because, you see, often we just think, oh, yeah, manana, tomorrow, down the track. But when you look at numbers like this, you start thinking, oh, would I make different decisions if I knew I only had 20 more years to live? All right? And then it gets really scary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway, in terms of current earnings, um, and I want to talk about this. Depending on your current age, depending what you currently earn, um, this is your potential earnings in total till the age of about 65. Right? And some of these numbers look really, really big. But remember what I said, every 20 years, your buying capacity halves, and you should write that down. So if those numbers look big and they look, well, you know, I've got another 40 years, well, remember, your buying capacity has quartered. So you need four times as much money just to lead the kind of lifestyle you currently have. So 100K today, oh, that's great, but in 40 years' time, you're going to need 400,000 to have the same quality of life. Who understands that? Right? And that's with kind of inflation around what we've had at the moment. Inflation could change, of course it could. All right, so I've just put some numbers on this. Look, I reckon 400 bucks a week net, you're broke, just getting by 600 bucks a week, moderately secure 800, 1500 for independent, financially free, 3,000 wealthy, 5,000 bucks net a week. Um, again, I don't care where you are on that, but it's just to put a number around it. Why? Because I want you to just write down a number right now. I want you to write down, so the aim of your financial life is to earn a passive income of X per week, which would give you the freedom to experience an extraordinary life. Don't look at your neighbor, figure it out for yourself. Write down a number, whether it's $500 a week, $1,000 a week, $2,000 a week, $4,000. I am going to make a suggestion to you. Write down a number, because we're going to do some multiplication and division right now. We're going to do some maths. Pick a number that is easy to multiply. <laughs> Pick a round number. Don't write down, I, I need $873. Just make it like a grand, okay? You'll see why, it'll be much easier. But has everyone written down a number? Yeah. Come on, I need you all to say yes. Yes? yes? All right. You can't look and you can't pass judgment. I know she's your sister, but you can't pass judgment. <laughs> you got sister's prerogative, okay. All right, now, I want you to now write down how many years, because you, know, you now have a finishing date, approximately. Right? I use by date, <laughs> all right? I want you to write down, knowing that you're going to be used by in maybe 30, 40, 50 years, how soon do you want to have that quality of life while you're still in a position to take maximum advantage of it, all right? Now, please, let's be realistic. And the same goes with writing down the number per week. Here's, the, here's a tip. If you write down a number that is so unrealistic, your subconscious will say, ah, oh, forget it, you're never going to earn that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a null and void exercise. This is what I suggest that you write for, for the, the income number. Think about what you earn right now, right? Because psychologically you go, well, yeah, I'm already earning that. I, I, I feel worthy of that. That's a whole different conversation, by the way. Um, but I could earn that. Maybe I could do it smarter and, and work less, but I feel as though I could earn that. Is everyone with me on that? Say yes. So write down a number that makes sense to you. By the way, with goals, can you revise them as you get closer to them and revise them up? Yes or yes? Yes. All right? So write down a number in terms of income that is relevant to you, that you think you can attain, and make sure it's a round number. Now I want you to write down, well, how soon do you want that number? Don't write down one or two years because subconsciously your brain says, well, how the heck um, can I get to that number passively in one or two years, right? Write down something like, as an example, 10 years or five years. Something again, your subconscious will say, yeah, I can accept that, I can work that out. Because we're gonna need these numbers. I need you to write them down because you're gonna share them with someone around you very shortly. All right, pick a number. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever your number is. Remember, the way we've been set up in society is we were gonna work for 40 years and still not achieve that result, 
Remember, that's what our society, our industrialized society, industrialized education system is setting us up for. 40 years and you still don't get there. Is everybody with me? Right? So anything is way better than that. So even 20 years is way better than, and having financial independence is way better than 40 years and not having it. Because by the time you get to the end of your working life, you realize, oh my God, it's not gonna give me what I want. It's too late. Agreed? It's always easier to start younger. Okay? So, can everyone yell out to me that you've written down two numbers, a, a, an income level and a, and a time frame? Yes? yes? Okay, great. Because we're gonna do some multiplications on it now. Okay? So we're gonna work out the financial freedom calculator. So, whatever your number is, let's say it was 2,000. In fact, I'm gonna do it on the board here, so I'm not gonna actually show you that. Um, I'm just gonna do it on the board. So, can we zoom in on this, please? Thank you. All right, let's say your number was $2,000, and that was per week, per week with a K, net. All right? Now, if I wanted to gross that up to per annum, I would multiply by how many? 52, but to keep the numbers simple, just multiply by 50, all right? So 50 times 2,000 is how much? 100,000. So that's per annum net, right? And you need to follow this method the same way on your piece of paper, right? Now, if I have, I would have to pay tax on that, agreed? So I need to gross it up for tax. So what do you think the average tax rate would be in Australia? It's about 30%. So add 30% to 100,000. So times it by 1.3. So what is it? <laughs> Guys, help me here. What is it? $130,000 per annum gross. Everyone with me so far? Yep. So I would need to be earning passively $130,000 per annum to yield me $100,000 net per annum, which would then give me about $2,000 per week net to give me the lifestyle that I choose. Everyone with me say yes? Yes. yes? All right. Now, how do I get to that? Would you agree that I need a nest egg somewhere that's yielding me 130K per annum gross? Yep. Correct? Yep. All right. So how would I do that? Well, um, first of all, how much would you expect? And let's say, for instance, as an example only, you had the nest egg parked at a really good bank earning a really great interest rate. Let's say a Bank of Queensland as an example, to just pick one, all right? And you could probably earn maybe, what could you earn long term? You know, because interest rates go up and down, don't they? All right, but long term, what could you pretty much be assured of getting over the very long term in a term deposit? Let's say five, maybe six, but let's just say five because it keeps my numbers simple, all right? And by the way, if, you th if your numbers are different, could you go home, stick it all into Excel and work out this exactly? If you wanted to, or a calculator or abacus, depending how old you are. Okay, so um, let's say it was 5% per annum. So how big would the nest egg need to be to be earning 5% to give me 130? Well, so I could divide this by five, but an easier way is 520s or 100, so just times this by 20, right? So either divide this by five, which is kind of, or just double it and add a zero. Is that easier? Yes. Okay, so the nest egg is 20 times this size to give me a 5% yield. So what's 20 times $130,000? 2.6 million, so I need a nest egg of 2.6 million as my nest egg. Now, I said, how long from now do I want to have that great lifestyle? Let's say I said it was 10 years. So I need to divide this by 10 years. So I need $260,000 per annum. Each and every year for how long? For 10 years. Now, divide that by roughly how many weeks in a, in a year, 52, let's say 50. So how many times does 50 go into 260? Let's say five, all right? So what does that mean, 5K per week? It means to have the lifestyle I dream about, I need to 
reverse engineer, I need to be saving $5,000 per week each and every week for the next 10 years, not spend a cent of it and put it in a term deposit, again, not touch it for 10 years while it's accruing. And then that will give me a nest egg of, let's say around 2.6 million, which will give me $130,000 per annum gross, which gives me the 100K per annum net, which gives me the $2,000 per week net, which gives me the lifestyle that I really wanna have. <laughs> Does everyone understand the mathematics? You all seem depressed now, I don't know why. <laughs> Does everyone understand the mathematics? Say yes. yes. All right, now let me ask you a different question. Who thinks that it is possible and likely and probable that you could save five grand a week net? Anyone think that's probable? I had one guy. He's in the mining industry, no dependency. He goes, hey, I could do that. And I'm like, of all the people to pick, I picked him. All right, but who's got some different numbers? Who's worked out their numbers? Who's got any different numbers to 5,000? What's your number? 5,200. 5,200? Okay, any other numbers? Come on, don't be embarrassed. Tell me your numbers. <laughs> you have to do a week number. Yeah. 10,000. 10, okay. So either you want a short time frame or a lot of money or a bit of both. All right? Five years. Five years, okay. Any other numbers? Any other numbers over this side? No? Well, again, think about the reality of achieving this because, guys, this is one way to achieve it. I know it's getting late, so everyone, quick, stand up, cross your arms, real fast. Everyone, stand up, cross your arms. Cross your arms, stand up, cross your arms, real fast. Come on, real quick, cross your arms. Yell out which arm is on top. Right. Okay, some people are lefty, some people are righties. Which is the correct arm? Right. The correct arm. Well, could be either, correct? Look around you, has everyone got their arms crossed? Yes or yes? yes. Come, on, come quick, hurry, hurry. We're waiting for you. Okay, great. All right. Now, you've all got your arms crossed, but you've done it in a different way. Quick, uncross your arms, flap your fingers like little butterflies and recross them the other way. Some of you can't do it. Some of you are really struggling. It's okay, it's all right, we'll wait for you. All right, okay. Now look around. Everyone's got their arms crossed a new way. But has everyone got their arms crossed? Yes or yes? yes. But it's different. Feels different. But you know what? If you did it a hundred times this way, would it become your new normal? Yes or no? Yes. You'd snap to it automatically. Here's the point I want to make. This is one way of achieving the end result. But you know what? There are other ways of achieving exactly the same end result. Grab a seat. Would you agree that trying to save and earn money is one way, but a really, really, really hard way of doing it? So let me ask a different question. How many properties would that be? $2.6 million nest egg, how many properties would that be? Three, four, five, six, maybe five, let's say five. Who believes that trying to save five grand a week net is like oh, next to impossible? But who believes that, you know, with the right skills and team, five properties over the next 10 years, well, yeah, that sounds kind of okay. Mm -hmm. who, who honestly believes that, right? And see, this is why we're gonna help you achieve things like this. And in fact, if you did the land strategy, I want you to think about this. For the price of buying one property, Right? You probably could have taken out maybe three or four land options right? for the same amount of deposit. If you add up the cash flow, you probably could have gotten another two. Right? And if there's nothing coming out of your pocket for a cycle, and when properties double every seven to ten years, what does land do? It triples. So you may not have to wait a full seven to ten years. It might be a five to seven year period. So by the time you then settle that land and build on it, and I'll do a bit more of this with you on Sunday morning. You could have built a house on there, and I've worked out some of the numbers because the land is the most valuable part of houses now. I don't know if you know this, but a few years ago, the percentage of house versus land price 
It went from land being the lesser to now being the major part of the value proposition. So in five to seven years time, I actually believe with all the trends, it will continue and it'll actually be a bigger percentage. But I worked out that under our system, you could actually have a portfolio of land that you haven't paid George any cash flow out of your pocket for you know five or seven years, right? You then choose to build a house on top of it because the house will be a lower value than the land. I worked out you'll be looking at probably around an LVR of about 60%. Somewhere around that. Could be 55, but could be 65%. I don't know exactly. Nobody knows. But based on the current projections, it's going to be around that. Do you know in some of these areas where the yield is already, you know, 5%, if you actually have a property that's only geared at around the 55, 60% mark, that means the yield on the whole value means more cash flow than the loan. What does that mean? Positive. Say that again. Positive. Bit louder. Positive. It's positively cash flowed. It's actually technically a positively geared, positively cash flowed asset. With no pain in between, George, you like that? And you've ended up with the same result. You've now got a portfolio of five or six properties that have got equity in them and cash flow positive, so there's no stress in holding them, is there? In fact, tomorrow we'll even talk about a strategy where what if it showed up on your asset side as an asset, but did not show up on your liability side? Who didn't even know that was possible? Right? Because that means that when a bank assesses you, they go, well, you've got no liabilities. Sure, you've got all these assets, we'll lend you more money. It also means if something ever goes wrong, the bank will never call you. It also means you'll never hit your credit file or anything like that. You see, there's always another level in terms of the finance, right? But you end up with the same result. A portfolio with equity, cash flow positive. None of the pain that everyone else goes through to get negative gearing to build their portfolio, but exactly the same end result. Do you like the sound of that? Yes. Come on. With some emotion, yes? yes. <laughs> all right, because that's what we work really hard to do for all of our clients, for all of our members. Can I go back to slides, please? Okay, so anyway, the financial calculator, I've just gone through that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so see, working hard and saving money alone is absolutely not the answer. It's really important when you go to a bank and you show that you've got some genuine savings and you've got a savings plan. That is unbelievably important, but most people don't know that until they speak to a mortgage broker. You need to show that, right? And in fact, you need to show, even if you've got money coming from other cash flow sources, it needs to be presented the correct way, otherwise the bank, they'll acknowledge it's there, but will say, we're not counting that. You have to do it the right way, and we'll talk about that more tomorrow when we talk about finance. All right, but part of that is you need to funnel it through the right structures as well. Okay, um, most people believe if they work hard and save, they will eventually become financially independent and free. No, media, governments, all of these people, friends and family that are well meaning will say, Yeah, that's the way, but always ask yourself, Is there a better way? Is there a faster way? Is there an easier way? All right, this is the single worst underlying belief system, which is currently responsible for over 95% of all Australians retiring virtually broke. Do you have a wealth strategy or retirement plan? Put your hand up right now if you currently have a written plan that you are following and you know, updating at least on a yearly basis for wealth. Oh, no one. Is it detailed and are you currently following it? Not completely detailed. But okay, or at half, or at what, half a person. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, Okay, one, one and a half, okay, out of about 106 people. Again, I suggest to you that by having people help you and kick you along the path a little bit and make you accountable to the exact numbers and the processes, it's going to help you immeasurably get to where you want to be much faster. All right? If you stopped work right now and didn't change your current lifestyle in any way, how long could you live off your investments and savings? Right? I already know some people in this room that could live off their investments indefinitely at this point. Okay? There are some people in here, about a week. <laughs> and again, no judgment on that. It's your choice. You decide how much help you want in terms of achieving that. And by the way, it's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen. 
over time. Based on your current personal income and expenses, how much do you save? Based on your current business and investment income and expenses, what is left over? Based on your current assets and liabilities, what is your current net worth? You need to be doing this at least on an annual basis. Some people do it literally ongoing, like it's dynamic. But you should be trying to at least do it every three months or you know, um, maybe every month or so. Okay, see today's about taking massive and immediate action. And whether that action is for you, taking baby steps, I don't care. Some of you want to do it in leaps and bounds, I don't care. You choose how fast you want to do this. Just make a commitment to yourself. For some of you it'll be, right, I've got a, a list of key things that I've learned. What's the first thing? I'm going to do that within the first week. What's the second thing? I'll do that within another week or the next month. You know, you could start with saying, right, I'm going to fill out my <laughs> personal assets and liabilities and sit down and see, well, what position am I in? What are the other loans out there? How much extra could I borrow or have as buffer? So I can feel safe at night. If something goes wrong, I know that I have enough buffer to make sure I'm afloat, stress free for the, for the next three months or six months because I want to do that for my family. That could be the most important thing that you do after this weekend. Who understands that? Right? I'm not saying you need to buy anything. I'm saying that just sort it out so that you can sleep comfortably and know that, man, I'm right for the next three to six months. Because you'll start to think differently. You'll see other possibilities and you want to take advantage of them. All right? The average Australian, I believe, has a full-blown case of financial cancer. Let's just look at some of these facts. All right, where are Australians ending up today? According to the ABS stats, this is individuals' income um, indexed by weekly earnings. And that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like in a bit more detail, right? And I just want you to look at the age of people at 65 and over, right? You'll see that the vast majority of them sit in the band of 150 to 399. Let me point it out on that side. The vast majority of Australians over 65 sit between 150 and 399, right? The vast majority. Now, do you think all of those people, when they started off their working life, thought they'd be in a better position by the time they retire? Yes or no? Of course they did. They were no smarter or any dumber than anyone in this room. They're made of the same stuff, you know, three quarters water or 80% water and about 10 bucks worth of chemicals in a bucket. All made of the same thing. Right? And they all expected they'd be in a better position, but look where the vast majority are. Now, if you look at the level of income that you and I would consider maybe, you know, okay or adequate, maybe, you know, $1,000 a week or more, right? Look at the numbers. Much, much lower. Why is that? And the question is, do you want to end up there? Now, will super help some people? Yeah, of course it will. But super was really designed for what purpose? So you're not reliant on the old age pension or, or the, pa the, the, pension, the age pension. Because by the time you get around to it, it may not even exist. That's the reality. Because there won't be enough taxpayers paying it. And what seems like a big number today, by the time you get to it, remembering that buying, buying um, capacity halves every 20 years, or buying power halves every 20 years, you, you know, the price, the price of petrol, bread, etc., is going to skyrocket by then. Okay, look at the facts. 40% of adult Australians earn less than $400 a week or 20 grand a year and they're broke. Massive 70% of Australians earn less than 675 or 35K per annum. That's mediocre. Only 2% of Australians at retirement earn over $100,000. Who's from Sydney? Is 100K and above like almost poor in Sydney? Yeah, it is. Sydney is the most expensive city to live in, right? Melbourne's second biggest population centre, Melbourne's actually much better value than Sydney. That's why a lot of people from Sydney actually move down to Melbourne, because you don't have some of the crippling toll costs and fines and all these sorts of things and the amount of time you waste in traffic, right? It's just the reality. I love Sydney. I'm from Sydney, but that's the reality of it. Okay, um, massive 81% of adult Australians who make it to age 65 live on $400 a week or less. They're dependent on the pension. Their families are forced to live in a very modest existence for up to a third of their adult lives. Here's a question. Do people have a lot more costs in terms of medical expenses when they hit that age? Yes or no? And are these medical things like systems, drugs, operations, are they getting cheaper or much more expensive? Much more. And you know what? I know stories of people who've had to wait like two years for a hip replacement in the public system. 
and I had to hobble around in massive pain for two years. Is that what you want your life to be about? By the way, this is supposed to be a little bit painful and uneasy. It's supposed to be. Because sometimes that's what it takes to get people moving. Humans will move fastest out of pain, but that can't sustain them. They need to do pleasure long term. Right? But these are the stats. 1.3% of adult Australians who make $65,000 a week or more. Um, why? These are the reasons. Poor wealth psychology. They're too lazy or too busy to learn how to create wealth. They never started to invest. They started to invest too late. Um, fear of borrowing money and having debt. I come from Eastern European sort of psychology. Oh, you don't want to borrow any money. Oh my God, imagine that. Don't. No, no. My parents taught me, you pay for cash, otherwise you, got, you can't afford it. Right? Now, you know what? That strategy saved them and it cost them. It's a double-edged sword. Who understands? They didn't understand the distinction between good debt and bad debt. They didn't get that. All right? But it stopped them getting into credit card debt and all these other things that are just too easy, particularly for young people, to get into. All right? Well, so why do 98.7% 90, of Australians aged over 65 retire virtually broke? Because they're reliant on the government pension safety net because they think, oh, it'll, it'll take care of me. All right? Um, but will it even exist in 20 years? I have this false belief that owning your own home is actually an asset. What does Robert Kiyosaki describe your family home as? A liability. A liability. Why is it a liability? Because it takes money out of your pocket. Thank you. It takes money out of your pocket. From a cash flow perspective, it's a liability because you have to pay rates. You have to pay maintenance. You may have to pay body corporate. You may have to pay land tax. Right? Who understands? It's a liability. <coughs> right? And any repayments you make on it, you can't even claim in tax under the Australian tax system. In the US, if you make loan repayments on your home, they're tax deductible. <coughs> right? So their system's different to ours. But ours is actually overall much more generous. Okay. Your home does not provide a passive income. You can't, you can rent it, and this is, this is one that people don't get, and I've advocated for a long, long time. Renting is much smarter than ever owning. Now, if I have the time, I will go through the numbers with you and prove it. And if I may say this without any offense to women, women are much more nesters than men. Is that a fair statement? Right? And so if ever I bring up that topic, they go, oh, you can't do that. And men go, well, just show me the numbers. Well, I don't care. <laughs> All right? If I don't have to do the maintenance, I'm in. <laughs> right? But the reality is that as soon as you own a home, the banks, even if you have an interest only loan, they will work it out on a P&I basis. They'll reduce it to 25 years and they'll say, okay, that's what your capacity is uh, after tax. Right? And they often add one or two percentage points to what's called a sensitivity analysis on there, and it absolutely kills your borrowing capacity. But you know what happens with rent? They just take the rent. And renting a property, and even Jamie talks about this as well. You know, at one stage he lived um, uh, in Sydney, um, up at Middle, Middle Cove somewhere, I just can't remember the place, but they used that house for like, you know, Australia's top model or whatever. It was just like this huge, huge mansion. Um, and he rented it because it made a lot more sense. No stamp duty on the way in, no capital gains tax on the way out, didn't have to pay any maintenance or, or do anything like that. And properties at that end of the market, million dollar pluses, do you know what the, do you know what the rental yield on them is? It's about 1%. So, Imagine if you wanted to live that lifestyle, you'd have to pay the mortgage and all the outgoings, round it out, it'll be 10%. He was paying a tenth of that with no overhead. And does that free up a whole lot of other cash to buy investment properties which are fully tax deductible? I want you to just change some of the beliefs that you have long held because you got them implanted from society, well-meaning friends and family, you got it from the newspapers, you got it from the government, you got it from the banks, right? You just got to change the way that you're thinking, okay? Um, principal repayments can be made to, um, can be used to create wealth through investments, right? I would rather, because when you have a principal and interest loan, the principal on an investment property is not tax deductible, only the interest is, right? So you've actually had to earn more money. If you grossed it up, you'd have to earn a whole lot more. So if you only had interest only, less money comes out of your pocket. Here's my question. The principal grossed up into pre-tax dollars. What else could you have done with that? You could have maybe controlled, not owned, but controlled another property. Who understands that? 
And so rather than having one asset growing for you, what if you had two? Who thinks that would be a better outcome? You'd still have to pay the mortgage on it at the end, but 40 or 50 years down the track, the LVR could be 3%. Or 50 years in case of Kimberley, 3% LVR. Would you care what the mortgage was? If you had a property with $160 million, would you care that you had a $4 million loan against it? Or oh, sorry, no, it was a $400,000 loan. You wouldn't care at all, would you? This is, this is why you've got to completely change the way that you think about this sort of stuff. And it doesn't come straight away, and it doesn't come easily. You need to, and this is why we produce all of our, our info on home studies, because you may need to watch it two or three or five times, and then ring like a consultant or, or one of the team they'll refer you to and say, can you just explain this bit to me? I'm really struggling. Or worse still, my partner who I love and adore and treasure, you know, he or she doesn't get it. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I, um, when I first worked out the numbers of renting, I lived at Randwick in Sydney, beautiful part of, uh, of Sydney. Anyway, I worked out that it was, um, we could literally rent next door for half the price. Like I worked out all the numbers, showed it to my partner at the time, and she looked at it and went, so you're telling me we can get a place twice as good? I was like, no, 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 I said we could rent at half the price, but it was too late. Who understands? It was just too late. <laughs> um, so we moved up to Manly and got this unbelievable, it was actually fair, fair light, and looking out straight down the harbour, this unbelievable place, three storeys with this lift, the best lift I've ever seen in my whole life, and just, you know, five star features. And that, the yield on that place was about one and a half percent, way cheaper than you could have ever owned it by renting it. Who understands? Right? So this is why you've got to rewire some of, the, some of the, the long-held treasured beliefs. Some of them, well, where'd you get them from? They could be based on misinformation or just being plain wrong, okay? All right, your home will cost you, on top of the mortgage, probably about 2 to 3% per annum, just in terms of your out-of-pocket costs, um, such as I said before, maintenance, um, you know, what else? Uh, maybe body corporate, uh, rates, uh, land taxes, potentially, all sorts of things like that. So even if you've paid it off, you know? Actually, I'll, I'll raise an interesting question. Some people may get this straight away. Um, when you actually buy a property and you pay it off, you own it, right? Not really. Thank you, that's the right answer, Michael. No, you don't really own it. Because if you really owned it, you could do whatever you want. You could build it 10 stories high. You could paint it bright pink, right? You, you, could, you would own all the air rights above it. You could drill as deep as you wanted to and extract all the minerals. You actually own the water rights, right? You could do whatever you want, but is that really the case when you own property in Australia? Do you own the air rights? No. Do you own the water that comes from the stream that flows behind you? No. Do you own um, the mineral rights? No. Can you build it 10 storeys high? No. You need someone else's permission. But if you own something, you shouldn't need someone else's permission to do something, should you? It's yours, right? And here's the kicker, even if it's paid off, the government can take it off you. If you actually own something, how can someone will take it away from you? Because think about this, who's heard the term compulsory acquisition, right? So if they want to build a freeway, they're taking it off you. I actually remember, there was, there was a, who's from Queensland? You know from Queensland, any Queenslanders? Oh, there wasn't any, okay. Doesn't matter, there was um, this two brothers and um, they were building a major freeway upgrade. And anyway, the, the property had been in the family for generations. Their father had left it to them. They wanted to keep working the land. There was a lot of sentimental value attached to it. Who understands that, right? The government said, no, nah, we need the freeway to go through there. We're taking it off your hands. And they only paid them because you're supposed to get market price for it. But to them, they actually thought it was worth more anyway, plus the emotional premium. The government paid them way less than they even thought it was worth you know, on the open market. But guess what? They had no choice. It was going to the government. And they would have had to fund a very expensive court case to try to get what it was worth. And all the money they would have spent on that, particularly if they lost, you know, it wouldn't have been worth it for them. Who understands? So if you own something, how can someone take it off you? Also, if you own it and you don't pay your rent, your rates, what happens? Or your body corporate, what happens? Can the body corporate end up suing you, right? and foreclose on that property. 
and, and the council, can they all do that as well? Yes or no? Yeah, the sheriff comes in and they take the property and they put it up as a sheriff's auction. They'll probably appoint a local agent to do it. You don't own it. Michael, you have legal title to it. That's not the same as ownership, is it? You have legal title. Very different. Okay? Do you know in some jurisdictions in the world, you actually own the land? And I mean you own it to the centre of the earth. But not in Australia. So if you never own it, why did you pay stamp duty? Oh, God. Don't get started. Don't get started. <laughs> I want you to think. Also, how long are you going to stay in that property for? How long? You buy a property to raise your kids in, right? It's just you and your, your, your partner to start off with. You get one child. You go, oh, I'm not walking up and down those stairs carrying my kids. Janine, you go, you go, to, you go to the four kids. You can't stay in the same house, can you? You need a what? Bigger house. You move to a bigger house. You got to sell the other one. You got to pay stamp duty on the new one, correct? Plus all the moving costs and everything else, the advertising, the, the cost you've got to pay to the agent, right? And then once you become an empty nester, you and your hubby, you don't, you don't want all the maintenance or the cleaning. You don't need such a big house. What are you going to do? Downsize. You're going to downsize, right? I spoke to, who's heard of Harry Dent? Harry's a friend of mine and we actually went through and he's got this great presentation. If you ever get a chance to see Harry, go listen to him because he goes through each of the different cycles, right, of what people do and when they change houses. Right? And he's got so much data to back it up, it's almost predictable. But the point is that in Australia, on average, you'll stay in a house about seven years. Right? The, the shortest is people up in Darwin, it's about five years. The longest is people in Victoria, they're closer to 10 years, but the average is seven years. So every seven years, guess what? You're going to incur selling costs, marketing, advertising, paying an agent, all the costs of moving, and also the stamp duty for something you never actually truly own. So my question keeps coming back to, why did you get a P&I loan? Why did you pay stamp duty? Why didn't you look at any other way of getting the same asset the same way? So I'll give you an example. Who likes the idea of nesting? Yeah. Oh, okay, Janine just volunteered, all right. Um, what if you did this? What if you just said, Mr. Landlord, I'll sign a lease for 10 years. As a landlord, how ecstatic would you be, I've got a tenant, no vacancy period for 10 years? Who'd be super ecstatic about that? And what if as a kicker you said, look, when we move out, right, we will repaint and recarpet. Yeah. You're super happy because if you were selling a property, you'd do that anyway, correct? But I want a bit of a discount on the rent. But you'll have no vacancies and the property will be fully reinstated to virtually as new status. But we'll say for 10 years, we'll even pay six months up front so you know that we're fair income. Would you be ecstatic? Right? From a nesting point of view, are you sorted? <laughs> and do you know, think, and I want you to think about this, you actually have more rights as a tenant than you would as an owner. You don't actually understand this, but under law you do. It is harder to get out a tenant than it is for a bank to foreclose and kick someone else out. Do you understand that? So you're actually safer. Whose head am I screwing with right now? <laughs> All right? And that would free up massive amounts of um, borrowing capacity. And by the way, your husband, Jason, mm -hmm. he'd be pretty happy because guess how much maintenance he has to pay for? <laughs> Zero. Right? Would he be happy with that, do you think? So I just want you to think that there are some other ways to approach this to get the same result. Okay? All right, um, debt on your own home will compromise your investment borrowing capacity. Um, your debt is at risk because you're the only person making the loan repayments. Oh, actually, I'll just mention something else. Do you know that some people, um, and you need to speak to Paul about this, but do you know that some people use part of their home for business? If you don't have a business, join Amway. I don't care. What, <laughs> pick something. But if you run part of your business from home, can you claim part of your rent in tax? Yes or no? I can't give you advice on that, but listen to everyone else what they're saying. But you wouldn't want to be claiming part of your mortgage and your rates and everything else in, in your tax. Why? Because then that, you lose your CGT 50% benefit. Okay? So in fact, there is a whole lot of really good reasons 
to think differently to achieve exactly the same result. Okay? All right, um, your ability to leverage your, your equity or money is lessened when you own a home. Um, all your energy and focus is committed to repaying your debt instead of creating wealth. Um, this is a very contentious thing because I want to highlight something. Um, there are, um, if you've ever read about the psychology of wealth creation, you'll find that there are two camps, right? And the best way to explain this is you may or may not know much about American football. Right? But they have what's called an offensive team and a what? <laughs> Defensive team. If you go to a lot of other Australian sports that we're more comfortable with, like soccer or netball or something like that, you have goal attack, goal striker, I think, I think that's what they called, or goal defender at the other end. Um, and I played soccer, I was really crap at it, um, scored an own goal in our, in our grand final, but I was a defender. Right? So I was at the very back and we had attackers at the very front. So we had different roles. Anyway, um, this philosophy around financial um, planners is this. They fall into one of two camps. They are defenders of your wealth or they are attackers to generate you more. And because of all the compliance and the risk and everything that, that our financial planners have to go through, the only thing they're focused on is, I won't say covering your butt, but to protect your money rather than grow your money. Who understands the difference in philosophy with that, right? You can't actually do both at the same time, right? So in fact, a financial planner, in my humble opinion, is actually a misnomer. It should be a financial protector and strategy around you know, maximizing your, um, your, your center links and your social security and all of that sort of stuff because they are brilliant at that. There is so much legislation around that, right? That keeps them so busy, they're brilliant at that. But the law and the way it's structured doesn't really allow them to come up with new ideas and try things because there's no reward to them and there's massive penalties. Who understands that? So this is why you've got to educate yourself. Do you know that you can do a financial planning course in probably about a month, a real estate course probably about a week, and you can have the same bits of paper as they do on the wall? I don't know if you know that. Right? Obviously, getting the piece of paper is not it. It's the experience of the individual and what they know. Right? That's how you've got to pick the right people. Would you agree with me that Paul, he's not just an accountant, there's plenty of other accounts with exactly the same qualifications. But he knows property, he deals with people in property, and he knows how to get people the best results. Who understands that? That's the sort of person you need on your team. All right, on a typical $300,000 loan, your total interest repayments average two and a half times, 800,000 in after tax dollars. I'm gonna explain a bit more about that tomorrow and why the system, the way the game is played completely screws the average person and they don't even know it, okay? Australian super system was never intended to provide retirement wealth, only a pension substitute. Illusions that super will pay handsomely at retirement, like 600K on super returning 5%, it only gives you 600 bucks a week income to retire. You know, and you know what the biggest fear of retirees is? Is what if I live longer than the money I've put aside? And they're terrified about that because they're just not earning enough on that big lump sum to make their life really the level they expected it to be. Um, so based on your current contributions, how much will you retire on and will this be enough to fund your retirement? Um, now, who do we look for for advice? Family, tips from friends, peer groups, accountants, lawyers, stockbrokers, real estate agents, financial media, investment books, seminars, professionals and qualified experts. Point I want to make in that is people fall into two categories. One is people who know their stuff, right? <coughs> and know what's going on, like the government, like the fund managers, all of those people. And you know what? They're running a business. They're doing it for their benefit. And if they help you along the way, that's kind of nice. Right? But they actually know the information. The other category is people that you love. Friends, family, mums, dads, brothers, sisters. Are they experts? No. They're well-meaning, but they may not have the right information. People that do have the right information, they need to look after their business interests first. You come second. Who understands that? This is why it's absolutely critical that you have to invest in yourself and your own education. Because who has more to lose and more to gain with your money? You. Yeah, me, you, you, <laughs> right, you know what I mean, all right? And that's why you've got to take ownership of it. And that's why you've got to be accountable to yourself, those close to you, and sometimes people need a bit of help, and that's where our consultants will come along and kick you up the butt and say, right, you're supposed to do this last month. Get these forms into me. Let's get this sorted, okay? All right, let me just quickly compare the average person 
um, versus the educated investor. Average person avoids or fears investing, buy things that, that cost them lots of dollars, have bad debts, pay full tax, get advice from uninformed family and friends, they work harder. They lose opportunities and time and they procrastinate. Whereas educated investors know they must invest. Why? Because they're leveraging themselves beyond themselves. What I mean by that is you have a finite limit of how much time you can swap for money. Agreed? Yeah. Right? And as you get older or you have kids or other priorities, it's even less time. Agreed? So this is why they know they've got to invest. They need a bigger asset pool working for them passively. Um, instead of buying things that cost them money, they buy things that make them money. They use good debt. They minimize their tax. They get advice from experts and specialists. They work smarter, they use opportunities in time, and they take action. In fact, an easy way to explain this is something that um, some of you know this, but uh, I just want to point it out here. Poor psychology, poor um, mentality is this. We are taught, can I jump to this please? Can I swap to <coughs> flip charts? We are taught by society, we are taught by governments, we are taught by banks and everyone else that you earn money. So this is poor thinking. You earn money, you pay tax, and you spend what's left. Would you agree that's what we are taught? Come on, yes? yes? All right, what do wealthy teach their children? And again, wealthy does not reflect necessarily your bank balance. You can have wealthy and be starting at zero. Donald Trump was in major, major negative. He was like millions of dollars in debt but he had a different level of psychology, yet he was made from the same stuff, 80% water and 10 bucks worth of chemicals in a bucket, right? And he managed to turn that around, and his number one vehicle was property. And the, the system he used within that was property options. Wealthy people are taught this. They earn money, they spend, and then they pay tax on what's left. And in fact, they could be earning the same money, but they can have a lifestyle twice as good. Or the same lifestyle may cost them half as much. Give you an example. In fact, who here is self-employed? Put them right up so I can see. And do you understand what I mean by you live your life through your business? Yeah. Come on, yes or no? Yeah. Right? What does that mean? Well, I'll give you an example. At one stage, I had to do some IT certifications. Could have done them in Australia. I went and did them in London while I was there, I had a, some drinks with some mates, right? I um, wanted to go to, to, um, to um, well, um, Los Angeles, right? To Anaheim, specifically. My partner at the time, she was actually going to a, a course over there, and I thought, well, I'll go and do a course. NetWorld Interop was on, which is a huge IT geek fest. They're so good. Anyway, I went to that. Pity I didn't understand, um, you know, time lags and um, jet lag, and I slept through most of the day. <laughs> and I was wide awake at night. But um, when I came back to Australia, Qantas said, oh, you spent your own time and money going to these courses? Wow, we'll hire you. And I got to be a project manager there, right? Um, but then South Africa, um, our parent company that I was working for full time, they had offices there. So I could have actually grabbed that leg as well and claimed that. But do you understand that while I was in each of these exotic locations, I, yeah, I did a bit of work, but I also had a bit of fun. And do you understand that when people do it that way, they can often claim some or all of it in pre-tax dollars rather than post-tax dollars? Who understands that? Right? So, you know what? I'm, I'm going to suggest to you, work out a way to have a business. Do you know what the best business is? A passive property investment business. Right? And if you have properties in other locations, by law, can you go visit them once a year? Twice a year at least, at least once a year. And does the law state what quality of accommodation you need to stay in? Or how you travel? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't say, <laughs> but, but you might say, well, I'll stay in five star. <laughs> All right? Now, yeah, you don't have to fly, you know, the cheapest airline. You don't have to stay in the cheapest hotel. You can pick something really nice. It's whose call? Yours. Do you understand that there's a different way of thinking? And this is why you need to be around people who think the same way, who can help and lead you and advise you on these sorts of ways of thinking. It's not difficult, it's just different. Same result, just done a different way. Okay, back to slides, please. Okay, so 
Our definition of investment is owning income producing assets that generate enough passive income to provide you indefinitely with the most extraordinary life that you can imagine as soon as possible. Wealth is not the amount of money you earn, it's what you keep and invest. Wealth is a continuous and never ending stream of disposable income from a growing asset base. Becoming a millionaire not for the money, but the person that you will become, right? Because you will show up differently. Many people make excuses as to why they haven't done it or won't do it or will never get around to doing it. They don't have a sufficient knowledge. Um, they haven't got enough time. She'll be right, something will change, it's too risky. I don't want to lose my house. Everyone tells me I'm crazy. The property market's about to collapse. Properties are too expensive. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and what? Over and expecting what? A different outcome. And is that what people spend most of their lives doing? I'll keep working my job, but I'll be rich one day. Hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure it'll happen. Never happen. All right. Um, no support from my partner. Um, can't work out a plan. Don't know my goal, so how can I reach them? I give up too easily. I'm looking for an easy and quick way out. Just can't be done. Surely it can't be that simple to make money. Otherwise, everyone would be doing it. Um, I'll actually, I'll tell you a story I had of, um, who knows where Queen Bean is, right? It's just outside Canberra. Anyway, I used to run workshops in Canberra once a month. I used to fly down there and everyone, there was probably about 30 people, were public servants bar this one guy. He was a, a physio or a chiropractor, I can't remember, um, from Queen Bean, ran his own business, right? Anyway, I would tell people all these strategies and they go, oh, that's not possible. I go, well, I've done it. Lots of our clients have done it. And the Queen Bean guy said, yeah, I've done it. In fact, he used to bring his records. See, I've done it. And they go, no, that's lies. You've doctored those. That can't be true. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually he said to me, Stephen, I love you dearly, mate, but I can't come along to this anymore because this is draining the life out of me. He says, I can't be around such negative people. It's killing me. He says, look, I'll just get the, the webinars and the newsletters. I might even come to the Sydney workshops, but I just can't be around these people in Canberra. Right? I'm not saying everyone in Canberra is like that, but some of these people were so locked in to their belief system right, and the public service mentality that they couldn't change. It was too much of a habit. Even if they had evidence in front of them, they could have verified and checked. They had people they could talk to independent right, that were, were just like them, but they just refused to believe it. And I actually think that's really sad, but you've got to be careful being around people like that. See, wealth begins and ends in the mind, right? To begin is the most important part of any quest and by far the most <laughs> courageous. Yes, I know, I can't spell, all right? I know, but that's just to see if you're awake <laughs> and you've passed. So well done, Joan, all right? Okay, that's according to Plato. Um, there's three ways to become rich in Australia. You inherit it or you marry it. Become a sports star or entertainer because they just seem to clean up and they can't do any wrong, particularly if they're AFL players from Western Australia, I don't know. Um, or become an investor. There's actually a couple of others um, which are becoming prevalent. Rob a bank, <laughs> but there's downsides to that. And number two is um, to sue someone. Right, and that's actually the fastest growing. Um, I don't know if you know, but um, after New York, I think Sydney and Melbourne are the most litigious places on the planet per head of population. So do you need to protect your asset base? You bet you do. All right, this is the World Wealth Report from Capgemini. Um, and these people deal with what are called ultra high net worth individuals, right? Anyway, Capgemini Annual World, Re World Wealth Report. Ultra high net worth investors, um, which they consider as having US $20 million or above, right? Um, do not invest in anything that is not available to the general market in terms of asset classes. So they invest in things such as term deposits, bank uh, um, houses, residential properties, industrial properties. They invest in shares, they use options. So all the sorts of asset classes in general they use it the same that everyone else uses. Now, do they get access to some very special deals within those asset classes? You bet they do, right? But they don't do anything that's so outrageously different that seems alien, okay? Um, but here's the one thing that Capgemini found that they do really, really well. They observe. 
they see what's going on, they discern, they figure out what suits them and what doesn't, and they take action. And you know what? The number three one is probably the most important because there are plenty of people who look and listen and understand and ask a million questions, but they're missing that last thing. And that's where all the, the real growth is. Okay? So just in terms of the, the landscape of what's available, and I just want to spend a few minutes on this. What could you possibly invest in? And I need to flick over to this, please. What are the different asset classes? Because I want to just do this from a, a different perspective than what you're expecting right now. What could I store my wealth in? The bank. The bank. Right, great. What else? So term deposit, things like that. What else? Property. Property. Okay. And are there different types of property? Yep. There's residential. There's commercial. Industrial. There's all sorts of retirement. There's specialized vehicles. Like, you know, all sorts of different ones. Okay. What else? Shares, okay. What else? Gold. Um, gold, silver, okay, precious metals, um, uh, art, yep. What else? And collectibles? Yeah, I'll just put art and collectibles because that'll cover that. Collectibles. All right. I don't know, I failed English at high school, so anyway. Um, what else? Business, great. Where else can you store your wealth? What else? <laughs> Mattress. Mattress, okay. <laughs> Mattress, wall, and garden. <laughs> Where else can you store your wealth? Okay, that's a really important one. Michael said in your head. I actually think by far the best investment you can ever do with the highest return ever is in your head. Because even if you lost all your physical assets, they could never take out what's here. And could you rebuild it in a quarter of the time or even a tenth of the time? Yes or no? Yes. Of course you could, all right? But where else can I physically store my money wealth and then be able to retrieve it out? Where else? Super? Yes and no, because super is a vehicle to go into one of these. Do you understand what I mean by that? It's just a structure, a legal structure to access one of these. So super in itself is not an asset class. It's a transparent vehicle to get to one of these classes. Who understands that? All right, so that's why I'm not gonna write super up there. What else? Where else can I store my money? And I can then pull it out. All right, is that it? Are we done, all done? How about government bonds? All right, that's another one. Look, there's a few others, but let's just leave it at that, okay? So here's my question to you. I want you to tell me which of these is without risk? Is it possible, for instance, that, um, let's start with something really simple. Is it possible with shares, is my money absolutely safe forever in there? Yes or no? no? No. Who's ever had a company, Ansett, Burns, Philp, I've had shares in certain companies that do no, long, no longer exist on the ASX. Because when they devalue down to zero, your script's worth zero. Who understands that? So they are not an absolute safe place to put money. Would you agree? Okay. All right. What else is there? What about business? Could you put money into a small business? Yep, but do you know the stats are 95% of small businesses go bust in the first five years, and of the 5% that remain, 95% of those go bust in the subsequent five years. When you run your own business, you work harder, longer, and get paid less than any of your employees. All the people that are self-employed are absolutely nodding their heads, okay? So forget business. All right, what about mattress, wall, or garden? <laughs> now, in the past, when we had paper notes, termites could eat them. Now we have plastic, so they won't eat them, all right? But is it possible to have a fire in the house? All right, is it possible for someone else to find it in your garden? Is it possible for you to forget where you put it, <laughs> right? Because remember, dementia, remember, you've always got to have the adventure before the dementia, right? <laughs> got to get out there, have fun, and ski, which is spend the kids' inheritance, all right? Remember that. You should write it down. Adventure before dementia and ski, spend the kids' inheritance. Just teach them how to be good stewards, and they can make their own money, all right? There was a, a woman in Israel. Um, I don't know if you follow Global Press, but um, she spa 
parked the most amazing scenes because her daughter said that her mother hadn't had a holiday for a long, long time. So the daughter said, you know what, mum, you go away, I think to, the, to one of the sea resorts there, like the Red Sea or whatever, I don't know, the one where you float, really, is it Black Sea or Red Sea? Dead Sea, dead sea that's it, the Dead Sea, yeah, yeah. All right, the Dead Sea. Anyway, mum goes away for a week holiday, loving it, comes home, daughter says, got a surprise for you, got, you know, got a, a lovely new bed and mattress and all the stuff. She goes, oh my God, I stuffed all my life savings into that mattress. Anyway, um, it sparked the biggest hunt by all these people in Israel going to all the tips, looking through garbage, trying to find this mattress. So anyway, um, I'm going to suggest to you that putting in the mattress is not good because, you know, mould or the wall for termites or someone else can find it or someone can just lose it or you have a fire. And plus, with depreciation, it actually loses its value. And in fact, one even worse scenario is, is, is it possible for a country to change denominations, like when they join the euro and there's only a period of time and that money then becomes completely worthless? Who understands that as well? So I'm going to cross that off. All right. Okay. Art and collectibles. Um, is it possible that um, the Van Gogh that you bought in Bali is not real? <laughs> I don't know. They swore to me it was real. It looked real. Not that I even know what a Van Gogh looks like, but they said it was a Van Gogh. And I spent all this money and it's not real. Does that ever happen in life? But it's not real. Okay. Or could you have a, a bottle of fine... Um, What's that really expensive wine? Grange. Grange Hermitage, yeah. See, I grew up drinking Tropicana. I don't know, it's in, the, it's in a cask, I'm happy, right? <laughs> All right, just so that you know, in Sydney, I was considered a Westie. In Melbourne, that's called a Bogan. So, um, uh, Subway's my favorite food. It's, uh, I'm a really simple dude, all right? Um, but anyway, could you drop a bottle of, of Grange Hermitage? Or could it get corked? right? And just be useless, all right? So it's not the greatest place to store wealth, all right? What about gold and silver? See, in Australia, we used to have the gold standard. Who remembers that? We don't have the gold standard. Our currency is what's called a fiat currency. It's a false currency. It's not backed by anything, right? Same in the US. They can just keep printing it until the cows come home, right? That's called inflation. It loses its real value. But here's a question for you. You know, for instance, gold. Everyone thinks, oh, it's really scarce. And it is somewhat scarce, right? And part of its value comes from, in the electrical um, and, and the um, electronics industry, it's got a lower resistance, right? So therefore, it makes really good contacts, right? And therefore, gold's used a lot because it also doesn't tarnish as easily and it's got good conductivity. It's really used a lot in the semiconductor and the electronics industry. But what if next year they find a better way of doing stuff or the next 10 years? They may choose to not need gold anymore. In India, right? Anyone ever been to India? Right? In India, they have gold buying season, right? It's called wedding season, actually. And people spend an enormous amount of money on gold, right? Do you think that culturally, some cultures change over time? So do you think that they may not need as much gold when future generations decide to get married? Right? Because they might do more love marriages rather than arranged marriages. They just don't need as much gold and pomp and pageantry. Right? Um, same with silver. So my question is, is a lot of people go to gold and silver or precious metals in times of economic instability because they think this is a safe haven. But what if there is a new currency that's created? Because there's talk about this as a reserve currency in the world. And therefore, people don't feel um, as threatened as much. And they say, I don't need as much gold or silver. Who understands that? Right? So this could lose some of its value. Right? So it's not absolutely safe. What else is there? OK, um, government bonds. How lucky would you be if you had Icelandic bonds or Greek bonds? <laughs> not very lucky. OK, is it possible for countries to go bust? Look at Iceland. Look what may happen to Ireland and Greece and Portugal and Cyprus. I don't know. But certainly you'd have to agree that the value of their bonds is much lower. That's why they're paying record interest rates, which they probably can't even afford to service. OK, so government bonds aren't absolutely safe either. Right. Well, what about, um, oh, this one's got to be safe. What about putting money in the bank? That's got to be safe, hasn't it? 
I was reading a textbook put together by some um, business um, tutors and economists at Newcastle University, and they were explaining about the Reserve Banking Act. Fascinating reading, by the way. Um, but basically what they were saying was the Reserve Bank and APRA are there to regulate our banks. They're not there to underwrite our banks. Most people think that our bank system is underpinned by the Reserve Bank. If they need money, they just get bailed out. No, they're a company, a special purpose company with some other specific benefits. But they can go bust just like other businesses. But because banking's a bit of a sacred cow, right? Governments, which won't bail out other industries where people are losing their money and their jobs, will bail out banks. There's a whole lot of reasons for that, and I don't want to go into that because some of them are political, okay? But think about this. In the US, a lot of banks have federally insured, pol federal insurance policies on their deposits. Well, if it's a bank, why do you need an insurance policy? Think about it. Now, Australia, when the GFC happened, the Rudd government at the time, they introduced what's called a sovereign guarantee behind our banks, up to a limit. And if you went past that limit with the deposit, you just went to another bank, put some more money in there, and you spread it out to get each of those sovereign guarantees. But if you had more money than the number of banks, guess what? Your money wasn't backed. But our banks are relatively safe. So the point is, are banks absolutely safe? By the way, in the US, over 100 banks have gone bust since the GFC. So my question to you is, is your money absolutely safe in a bank? Come on, yes or no? No. All right, what about property? Let's just do property in one hit. Property's got to be safe, right? Is property absolutely safe? No. Could properties drop in value? Yes. Some more than others, yes. right? Pro properties that have less land component and more air and concrete, they often drop more. And those that are really expensive in GFC times, they drop more. So who remembers straight after GFC, the reports on the Sunshine Coast, there were properties um, around Noosa and places like that, they dropped by 20%, some of them up to 40%. Right? So is that absolutely safe? No, property is not absolutely safe. Sorry, who said that? You're absolutely right. Nothing is safe. And that's why I want to do that exercise with you to point out that nothing is safe. There is a risk to reward ratio in everything that you do. And that's the way you've got to think about any asset class. I'm always taking some risk. Would it be safe to say just getting up in the morning, having a glass of water in Sydney? <laughs> Who remembers when the cryptosporidium was in the water? And the water authority in Sydney was saying you have to boil every glass of water beforehand. That was Sydney, which has got some of the safest water and the best tasting in all of Australia, because Warragamba Dam allows more settling than any other water reservoir in Australia. Much better than Adelaide's water, right? <laughs> that's true. That's easy. That's easy yeah, that's easy, yeah. <laughs> all right. But is there risk in everything, right? And that's the point I want to make. By the way, does anyone know, out of all of those asset classes, which gave the highest return? Anyone take a guess? What did you say? Property? Who says anything else? Shares. Shares? Anything else? Gold. The answer is collectibles. I actually did a magazine article on this. I was interviewed. I have a case of Duff beer at home. Who drinks Duff beer? I had one. It's Homer Simpson. <laughs> right? I bought my, my slab of, of um, Duff beer down at Guy Mere in the, in the Shire. Anyone from the, Sydney from the Shire? Well, who's heard of the Shire? It's really annoying when you're on trips overseas and you all go around there, where are you from? And blah, blah. Oh, I'm from the Shire, birthplace of the nation. You could have just said Sydney. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just all the Australians go, oh God, one of those again from the Shire. All right. Um, anyway, but I bought my case for $16. At the height, it was worth 10,000 US dollars. And that's when the Aussie dollar was about half of that compared to the US dollar. So I could have cashed in for 20 grand. My $16 case, 20 grand. I could have, but I, I love the Simpsons, right? Um, so I didn't. Right? And beer doesn't last for very long, and I've had it for a long, long time. So it's absolutely gone off. But you know what? I wanted the case of Duff Beer because as soon as the producers found out that it was either Cutley United Brewers or um, the other mob, 
um, were brewing it, um, they sent them writs to cease and desist and destroy all of their, 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 their stock immediately. And luckily I just had a case before they pulled them all off the shelves and destroyed them. So um, collectibles give you the highest return. But there's no cash flow on them. You can't gear them. They're really hard. But generally, do you know what some people pay for an old Coca-Cola bottle? It's it. And you used to get them for free and they're worth like, you know, $10,000 or, or whatever the number is. Okay? So they give you by far the best return. But they're one-offs. They're kind of like the little bits of fun that you have in your portfolio. They're not going to give you the, the steady income and the lifestyle that you and your family want and deserve. Who understands that? Okay, so you know if we go through all the the different things, there's a whole lot of them in terms of the landscape. Every time you invest in anything, you've got to decide: will this fit my strategy? Do not look at it from how do I make this asset fit my strategy. You start with the strategy. You start with the blueprint. You start with what's important to you, and you find things that match. Okay, so fundamental questions you ask: Does property have the right fundamentals? Now again, you might say no to this, and that's cool, I don't care, right? Um, I like the fact that people need to live somewhere. And has it been like that for years, decades, centuries? I don't know how long humans have been around, but like, let's say a million years. Have humans always needed shelter? And I anticipate they will always continue to need shelter. So that's one of the reasons I like property, residential property, right? And who's actually been to my land seminars or heard Conrad speak about land? There is a conspiracy between governments and developers and financiers to automatically move the price of land up. And it doesn't happen with property, it only happens with land. And I like the fact that all the key players are forcing the market up and up and up and I'll just hang on for a long time. They're manufacturing capital growth for me doesn't happen in any other asset class. And one of the other key things I like about property, and specifically land, is we live in a Western Keynesian economy, which, is, which price for commodities is determined by the interaction of supply and demand. That's a really long sentence, isn't it? So let's make it simple. Bananas. When Hurricane Larry came in, wiped out the bananas. Huge demand, no supply. What did bananas do? They went up. Later on, after they replanted, there was plenty of bananas and the demand was the same. So there's more stock than the demand. What did the price of bananas do? Went back to about $2 a kilo, right? At one stage at the height, jewelers were putting bunches of bananas in their windows, <laughs> right? It's like gold, okay? One of the other reasons I like land is it doesn't obey the laws of supply and demand. That's a big statement but I'm going to prove that to you on Sunday morning. Because everything else does, but land doesn't. You will see that the demand fell by 50% or more. But guess what the land price kept doing? You'd expect it to fall, but guess what it did? It kept moving up. Now that's pretty incredible for an asset class. Who would agree with that, right? And uh, particularly if you can gear against and get money really cheap to expand expose yourself to more of it, that's pretty impressive too. All right, will it outperform the media market in the long term? Would I consider personally investing in it? These are all questions you've got to ask yourself. Does this strategy make sense? Put your hand up if you currently live in a property or have ever lived in one. <laughs> cool, you all understand property. It's not some weird stuff that I've got to show you all these charts and explain all this new terminology. You already get it. And this is what I feel in life is that if you already get something and it makes sense to you, it's going to be easier to continue with it rather than having to fully re-educate yourself, okay? Um, does the strategy suit me? Actually, let me t t talk about that for a second. You know what? Um, who here trades FX or options or th something like that? Anyone do that? Okay, would you agree that's a pretty fast market, right? If you don't take notice for a couple of minutes or a couple of hours or even days, Depending on your strategy, you could have lost everything. Maybe. Maybe. Depending on your strategy, right? If you use collars and things and insurance, you're fine, but some people don't, right? But here's the interesting thing. Do you know that I might not get back to a rental manager for hours or even days and the world hasn't collapsed? And in fact, 
I could even hand over to someone my complete strategy. And I've done this in the past. I've said to my sister, I said, I'm going overseas. Rent's going to come into this account and the mortgage is going to come out. Do you get it? She went, yep. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Any questions or problems, just call me. Right? It's simple. You know, I can explain it to anyone and they'll get it. But if I tried to explain a collar, right, and a, and a moving average, um, and, you know, trading in channels, right, or the stochastics or, or things like that, would you agree that that's a lot more complicated? I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying it's a lot more complicated. Who understands that? All right? So it suits me. Where would I be today if I'd implemented the strategy 10 years ago? And I just want you to think for a moment. If you could go back 10 years, how different would it be if you had a portfolio today of properties generating you lots of equity, lots of cash flow? Um, you know, will the residential pop bubble burst? There have, there have been people who said, well, Australian properties will drop by 40%. In fact, after the GFC, can I flick over to um, this, please? After the GFC, does anyone know what the Australian share market dropped by? So the ASX, do you know what it dropped by? It's 45% down. Listed property trusts, and now they're often called REITs. Do you know what it did after the GFC? Dropped by 55%. Do you know what the Australian residential property market did? Take a guess. No, it dropped 3%. Why? Do you understand people need to live somewhere? All the stuff that made the headlines was the properties in you know, um, Noosa that were dropping by 20 or 40%, they're on the beach. But who owns those properties? Multi-millionaires that have businesses that have tumbled and the bank says, the only thing of value left is your property, we're selling it. And all the people who can afford to buy them, they're losing money, no one's gonna buy it. But understand this, if properties are dropping by 20 to 40% at one end, if you understand what an average means, if the average was 3%, what were properties at the other end of the spectrum actually doing? The ones at the lowest end were actually going up, right? And this is why properties, particularly at the lower end, it's really hard for them to fall simply because of the replacement cost, right? Can they vary a little bit over time because of interest rates or sentiment? Of course they can. But long term, it's hard for them to drop at the, at the lowest end a lot, simply because people up the top who are losing money, they'll downshift. Right? It's really that simple. Okay, back to slides, please. Okay, there was um, comments such as, um, I don't know, who's heard of um, Professor Stephen Keane, University of Western Sydney, Associate Economics Professor? Right? He said that, oh, they'll drop um, by 40%, and he said that he would um, jog the 200 kilometres, I think, um, he'll walk more than 200 kilometers from Canberra to the top of Mount Kosciuszko, um, wearing a t-shirt saying that I was wrong. Now, to his credit, he actually did that. Um, he sold his own property because, oh, it's gonna crash by so much, and in fact, his properties went up, but let's, let's ignore that. Um, but uh, on his t-shirt, he had a big graph, and he said, I'm doing it for charity, and down the very, very bottom, in really tiny, tiny writing, it said that I was wrong about the property market. Um, but he did the walk. All right, um, uh, oh, that's sort of actually said, I was hopelessly wrong on home prices, ask me how. That's what he had to have written on the shirt, but it was really, really small. <laughs> and on the press release, he completely changed the reason why he was doing the walk. So um, look, uh, and tomorrow I'm gonna give you a market update as to all the drivers that you can check for yourself. And if you understand them, you'd actually ask yourself a really simple question like, how is it possible? Now, a lot of people say, well, we're just like the US. No, our market is completely different to the US. And I'll explain a whole lot of the reasons why theirs could fall and ours can't fall anywhere near as much, okay? Um, look, people have used lots and lots of excuses over the years to not get into the property market. And here's just some of them. Um, 83, there was a recession with high interest rates with peaking inflation. Mid-80s, mid commentators were saying that residential property prices were too high and no one could afford to get into them. God, if only, you could, if only you bought 10 of them in 83, 
guess what position you'd be in today, right? Lots and lots of excuses. Oh, in 85, the Australian government said, oh, we're going to get rid of capital gains tax. And everyone said, oh, it was going to be the end of property and all these sorts of things um, that have happened. Um, you know, I can go through them with you in detail, but there's, there's really no need. People will always find reasons um, to not get into the market. But see, you can make money or you can make excuses. You just can't do both at the same time, right? Warren Buffett sums it up really well. Be fearful when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. This is um, a little graph that shows what the, and it's only the reason they pick Sydney is because it's got some of the longest and deepest data, right? And it shows um, the price up to about 2006, and it shows for since the 1990s what it's done. And it's overlaid with that some of the really bad press that was um, going on um, in the market about, you know, is it a bubble, is it a bubble, is it a bubble, all these sorts of things. Now, um, if you look in detail, this is from 1901 to 2006, and you see this little kind of dip here, right? That's 2003. Hello, all right. That's kind of, um, there's a little tiny, you can't even s sort of really tell much of a dip there, right? Can you see that there's, that, that little dip that you saw on the previous slide is that tiny, tiny, tiny little indent there. And guess which way the market's gone since then? It's just kept going up, right? Simply because there's too many people with too much money and too few properties in places like a Sydney and a Melbourne and a lot of other our capital cities, okay? And tomorrow I'll go into a bit more detail, but is there a trend there? Which way is it trending? Up. Do you think it'll slow down? Yeah, you know what? I think in some cities, um, and BIS Shrapnel just released a report the other day, they said um, Melbourne, Adelaide and a few others will actually slow down a bit. You're going to find places like Sydney because they didn't build anywhere near enough for the last couple of years. They'll actually pick up a little bit, okay? But I look at it for the long term, I look at the whole deal structure, okay? Um, and this paints the picture perfectly for me. All right, this is our major capital cities. And I want you to look at, there is one decade in that slide that made more money than the previous decades. And it's the same for each city. Now, what, year, what decade was that? What year did it start? It was the year after 96, because the, the chart before that shows, that the, the bar chart shows it finished 96. So what's the year after 96? 97. So the decade starting about 97, for all the cities, not just one, but all of them, guess what? The price went nuts. Now, does anyone know what happened in 97? If you've been to one of my previous seminars, you do. Or one of Conrad's seminars. What happened in 1997? Does anyone know? No. Thank you. Say it please a bit louder. We went from what? Surplus. We went from surplus into... Uh, shortage. shortage. Write that down. In 1997, the Australian property market went from surplus into shortage. Does it make sense when there's more people with more money and less properties, what do you think will happen to the price of properties? They'll go up, a little bit or a lot. And they went up a lot. And in fact, uh, tomorrow when I give you a market update, I'm going to show you all the factors that contributed to that and why the prices have kept going on and on and on. In fact, if you added it up, that last decade for each one of the cities made more money than the previous four decades added together. And I'll show you tomorrow why all the fundamentals that caused that to happen, not only have they not been fixed, but guess what? They've gotten worse in the Australian market. But I'd like to challenge your thinking a little bit. And we're nearly done for the day, but who was around in 1996? Well, all of you should actually have your hands up. <laughs> I know it's late, but we're all around in 1996, agreed? All right, unless you're really, really young. No, you're, you were still around, but you probably weren't looking at the investment market since you're 20 years old today. Now, you were born, but you were like, what, four? Yeah, I was four. Four, okay, all right, you've got an excuse, all right? Um, but I want you to think, if you're in Sydney or Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide or Perth, let's pick Melbourne. Median price of property was $144,000. Today it's actually about five fifty-one. dollars How many properties should you have bought 
in 1996, knowing what was going to happen. If you knew what was going to happen today, who would have loved to have gone back in time and bought a whole stack of them? The whole street. Who would have loved to have done that? Yeah. All right. Well, guess what our system actually allows you to do? It actually allows you to be a time lord. It allows you to rather than be controlled by time, it allows you to control time. Imagine this. Imagine you could have gone back in 1996. Imagine this. You could have lay by one of those properties. <laughs> I'm serious. Imagine you could lay by it. So 144,000 if you only put down a very small amount. Nothing more out of your pocket for the next decade. And by the time you get to settlement, that property is worth 432,000. You go to the bank and say, I need to borrow the other 90%. I need another 130,000. If your asset is worth 432,000, do you think the bank would lend you 140 grand? Yeah, that's like a 30% LVR. They'll say, do you want some more money? What about curtains and furniture? <laughs> we'll give you some more. Because the banks make money on that. Right? Because that's exactly what our system allows you to do. It allows you to lay by and then just wait four, seven, ten, up to 12 years. Who thinks that's pretty exciting? All right? That's what the system's all about. Um, so, guys, um, I'm going to give you some homework to do. Right? This is your homework. I want you to think about asset classes, I want you to think risk to reward. Right? I want you to write down asset classes that you want to use to build your wealth. And I want you to write down why that asset class. Specifically, why. Again, I don't care what it is, but if there's property in there, we can help you with that part of it. Does that make sense? We can help you do it much smarter, much better, to achieve exactly the same outcome that everyone else has. By doing it this way, we'll help you achieve the same result, but by doing it this way. Okay, so that's your homework. Guys, um, I, it's 10 minutes past eight. I've gone 10 minutes over time. Uh, sorry for that. Um, so tomorrow morning, we'll start at about nine. So make sure you're here just before nine. Um, we'll have some more people in the room. So please shake it up a bit. Sit with some new people. Um, we'll go through the, um, the homework first thing. So just think about, you know, you don't have to be too specific about, I want asset allocation of this amount of dollars or this percentage of my portfolio. Just start thinking about what are the asset classes that suit you, that make sense to you, why are they important, and how you want to actually use those moving ahead. Guys, have you learned a lot today? Yes. All right, have you enjoyed today? Yes. Fantastic. We've got some great speakers coming up over the next two days and some fantastic content. What I also suggest that you do, guys, is... Um, in your list of things that you've learned, you may want to update that tonight because if you've learned some great things today, you may not have had a chance to update your key distinctions list. So if I can suggest to you, give yourself two or three minutes before you pack up and leave, turn to your distinctions, write them down. Or if you catch your train or a bus or whatever, write them down. But it's better if you just spend two or three minutes right now while they're clear in your head just put it down on paper because that'll lock it in a bit more. Otherwise, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. <laughs>